Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Melina Palmer is founder and CEO of The Brainy Business, which provides behavioral economics consulting to businesses around the world. She hosts an excellent podcast, The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. Melina has contributed research to the Association for Consumer Research and the Filing Research Institute, and she runs the Behavioral Economics Business column for Inc. Magazine. She teaches applied behavioral economics through the Texas A&M Human Behavior Lab, Go Aggies, her new book is What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You. I have to give it a big thumbs up, if for no other reason than I wrote the foreword. Welcome to the show, Melina. Thank you so much for having me. I was struck by something just about a day ago. I was looking at the actual paper edition of the Wall Street Journal, Melina, the weekend edition, and in the op-ed section, there was a lengthy piece by Daniel Kahneman and his co-authors of his new book, and just like one page over was also a column from Dan Ariely. I'm thinking this is the preeminent business publication in the U.S. And here we have behavioral economics, not in one spot, but within two spots within just a page of each other. Do you think that behavioral economics has finally hit critical mass? I think there's still some room to go before we make it to critical mass, but we're definitely on the way. It's been interesting with you know, with my book coming out this month in May. And so Katie Milkman has a book out, like you said, Kahneman and Sunstein have co-authored a book. Uh, there are so many others where you just look and it's like another book, another book, another book <laughs> coming out right now. So I think it has been on the rise for a long time and people are really catching on that this is something to pay attention to and listen to. And I'm glad to see it getting more traction. I guess it's a fine line between competition and also validation of the space. <laughs> you know, if you had the only book about behavioral economics, then people would say, well, that's kind of an outlier, some weird thing for eggheads. But when you suddenly see best-selling books about behavioral economics, and that says, okay, this is a reasonable space, and Molina's book may have something different to offer than the others, which of course it does, because I've got it uh, here for our video audience, and it is really a very uh, practical guide to how to apply this technology or this science. Unlike, there's not a, that much theory in it. Their theory is there, so you can do the research if you want, but it's a very practical guide, perhaps a little bit different than what Daniel Kahneman might write, uh, because he's not really a digital marketer or really a marketer of any kind. So, so I'm curious, Melina, we've seen this additional acceptance of behavioral economics in business. Have you noticed an uptick in negative or somewhat unethical uses of behavioral economics or behavioral science? Thing, you know, what people call dark patterns? Uh, thankfully, I haven't seen a lot of that. And more, I, I get asked about the ethics and is it manipulation on pretty much every conversation that I have, which I'm guessing you've experienced a lot of that over the years as well. <laughs> And, you know, to me, what I have found in working with all sorts of businesses from solopreneurs up to global corporations is most everyone is trying to, they work for something they believe in that they think is of value to people and they're doing what they can to help others to find this product or service that is a really great fit for them. They're trying to solve a need. And while there's a small fraction of people that will do ill with whatever new knowledge they have available for them, I just don't see as much of that. I think availability bias makes us think that it's this gigantic percentage of people that are going to uh, take things and use them for ill-gotten gains. But truthfully, I, I thankfully don't see much of that. Well, that's good. I guess the sorts of things that I've observed, and I'm not sure they've really increased that much over time. In fact, many of these techniques were in use long before behavioral economics was a thing. But things like false scarcity, sales that expire at midnight, and the next day that same sale is on expiring at midnight. Things like adding friction, making things more difficult that you don't want customers to do, like make returns, for sure. example or unsubscribe from a subscription that's going to automatically renew. That, unfortunately, I still see quite a bit of, even with organizations that you would otherwise say are pretty good companies, but, it, but it's a fine line. You know, at what point does 
simple saying, well, okay, we want to make sure that people really want to make this decision suddenly become, well, okay, we're going to make this really rather difficult so that we'll convince some people that it's not worth the trouble to bother changing their mind. Yeah, I think there is a lot of benefit uh, that the field is getting uh, its traction really at a time where you have an era of social media and where when people do see those sorts of things, and especially as people are starting to understand the science, being able to say, you, I know what you're doing and it's not okay. I think that companies have been publicly shamed if they try to do stuff or make things too difficult. That makes it to where it's really not worth that risk of trying to make it worse. Some do, you know, like you said, the false scarcity or, or things like that. But um, I think people, consumers are pretty aware of when that is happening and are not afraid to go complain on the socials if something is out of alignment. I have been one of these shamers. I try and do my best to shame any examples of either high friction experiences, like unnecessarily high friction experiences, and also things that are kind of a negative use of influence principles. In fact, just about a week ago, I aired a conversation with Bob Cialdini and at that point suggested that maybe a hashtag bad influence would work for that if folks encounter that mm -hmm. somewhere. And I'm sure we all do uh, to call it to the public's attention, because as you say, there is considerable pressure once a company realizes that they're being called out on this. And often it's probably not top management that is even aware that this is being done. You know, I think that in general, at corporations, top management rarely experiences what the customer does, what a regular customer does. If they need something done, their assistant does it. And they uh, probably did not order their people to add friction to the unsubscribe process. But somebody said, did an A-B test said, well, hey, if we put this extra step in there, fewer people unsubscribe, so let's do it. So anyway, I think that we should ex exhort our viewers and listeners to do that. If you see stuff that is wrong, if people are misapplying these principles, I'll call them out in public and perhaps the rest of the community will amplify that. <laughs> so I, I have a question for Melina. If a business has become aware that, okay, behavioral science is a thing, behavioral economics is a thing, we aren't really thinking about that at all in the way we're currently marketing to our customers. Where would you suggest they begin? How, how can they bake some behavioral economics into their marketing? Well, I think the first step is to get some awareness of how much bigger the field is than you think it is when you first get introduced. So you read Nudge or Predictably Irrational or the new expanded uh, version of influence like you're talking about, <laughs> and you have a, a little piece and think, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to go jump in and apply. If you don't think about all the associations of the brain and the complexities and understand context and all of that, you can inadvertently set up a test that's too big or looking at the wrong problem and feel like it's not a field that actually works or that it's not true, it didn't work for you, something along those lines. And so when, when a business tries to apply this, the problem I see most often is uh, trying to attack the wrong problem and or just again, starting with far too large of a problem that you're trying to solve when you get started. So if you do some smaller tests and then have some understanding of a few basic con concepts and how they would go together, then it gives you this ability to start building things together. I use in my book an analogy of behavioral baking. Say if you wanted to open a bakery, you first need to know what the ingredients are and how they work. You know, butter, sugar, flour, and eggs can be combined to make all sorts of different things. Uh, you could be making cake and cookies or bread, but if you don't know that you need more flour than sugar or whatever that is, or how the, what the eggs are there to do, if you just throw everything in a bowl, you don't know what you're going to make. It's a big mess. And so if you have a plan and a bit of a recipe to follow, you know how those concepts, ingredients are going to work together. It gives you a safe space to start applying the concepts and um, testing it out. You know, I primed you there, Melina, with the word bake into <laughs> your marketing. So I, I figured that's where you would end up with that. <laughs> so I have primed you. Why don't you talk a little bit about priming as 
our audience might yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. I love the concept of priming. And this is where if we have, uh, like you said, a word that you said that brought up, you know, baked in, made me think of my behavioral baking analogy in the book. Um, but also you can do this with smells, with visual implications, with the power of touch. You know, the senses are very closely tied in with priming. And so something that happens before whatever the action is that you're looking to uh, take is, is much, is very, very important. And so if you have an example, let's say that there was a study that was done uh, where they had people, they were asking to uh, work together in the room. And for some people, there was a briefcase in sight. For some, there was a backpack in sight. And that study found that those in the briefcase room were more combative. Those in the backpack room were more cooperative. But of course, everyone said they didn't even see it. They didn't even realize there was a bag of any kind there, but it influenced their behavior because they were primed by what it means and what's associated with each of those things. You know, backpacks remind us of school and working on group projects and a different type, whereas briefcases are, you know, boardrooms and fighting over cash or, you know, whatever that happens to be. So those associations impacted the way that their brains approach the problems they were working on and being part of those teams. One concept that I wasn't that familiar with before I read the book, or at least the terminology was partitioning. And by, by the way, I did, of course, read the book because you were kind enough to invite me to write the forward, Melina, which I appreciate. And uh, explain partitioning and what how people can use that. Well, absolutely. And of course, or how they shouldn't use right. that. Should or shouldn't. Yeah. Well, and so of course, also thank you so much for writing the forward. It was a great honor to have you do that for me. So, uh, love having you being included in the book there. And of course there are a couple references to friction throughout the book as well. In the case of partitioning, this is having a separation can and how you have these little kind of transaction costs and how it can impact behavior. Uh, the example that I like to use is, you know, if you were to sit down with the giant bag, you know, party size bag of Cheetos uh, versus a bunch, if you had, you know, an unlimited supply of little fun size bags of Cheetos, how do you eat more in one scenario than another? And of course, Yes, you do. <laughs> when you have the large bag of Cheetos, you've already, you've made one decision. I'm going to eat chips. And then every time you reach back in for another handful, you're just reinforcing a decision that you already made. And so keep on eating until you either get a stomach ache or you hit the bottom of the bag. And that's sort of how that works. Whereas with the fun size bag, each time you go to grab another one and have to open it, it's that tiny little moment of do I need those? Should I get another one? Separating that into those little multi decisions can make it to where someone will make a different choice and will eat less. And so that's important to know. And you can use it both uh, where it's good to have the break points. And sometimes you don't want to have those break points. So in that space, I give the example of Netflix. And if you had to re engage, you know, every single time that an episode ended, do you want to keep watching? You know, you have often that setting after like five shows or something, they'll say, are you still watching? <laughs> uh, but if it was to stop every single time, or there was uh, something that's reminding you that you're paying every single time along the way, it would be a worse experience for everybody. People wouldn't use Netflix as much. They wouldn't um, engage in the same way. So making the single decision to watch a show is a better viewing experience. And of course it's better for Netflix to keep people in there. Whereas if you are trying to get people to break up their, whatever habit that they're working on and having those small transaction costs along the way can be beneficial, you know, even as simple as encouraging someone to buy smaller bags of Cheetos if they're trying to lose weight. Well, I would guess that's a big argument for auto renew for any products that have a renewal process, which these days it seems like nearly everything we buy is sold as a subscription. The more you can have customers on an auto renew basis, they don't have to redecide each time. And again, as long as you don't make it unethically difficult to unsubscribe, that's I think a perfectly fine thing to do because there will be many people who simply won't want to make that extra decision. They, for whatever reason, won't auto won't renew manually, but even if they were finding value in the service or the product, and would have renewed otherwise. 
Now, loss aversion is something that really underlies so much in behavioral economics. It's one of Kahneman Tversky's initial major findings that humans tend to be averse to losses and the losses are more important than equivalent gains. And one scenario that I really hadn't thought about in terms of loss aversion is with a product that may be sold in either, say, a basic version or a loaded version with many additional features and benefits and so on. And how should a salesperson approach that kind of a sale? Is it better to lead with the inexpensive item and then build up to the more expensive one or vice versa? Well, we're definitely getting into relativity there as well and some anchoring in our loss aversion example, in which case there are always exceptions to every rule, but in general, you would want to go with the biggest thing first that's the more expensive with the bells and whistles and work your way down. So if you come in and say, you know, you're going to buy a car and in that experience, do they say, this is the baseline model and it would be $200 a month. And if you want, these are all the things you can add on of power door locks and power windows. And you have to tick, 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 tick <laughs> your way up on the process. No, <laughs> what they do is they say, this is the super amazing version of the car and this is what your payment would be you know 295 a month or whatever and if there is anything if they maybe balk at the price then you say here's the list of stuff feel free to get rid of anything that you don't want then your loss aversion of course kind of comes in you go well i mean the backup camera is only 500 you know it's for 500 dollars. it's gonna be and it's like a couple bucks a month. I, I can make that. I'm going to get $5 a month of value out of my backup camera. That's worth it. Whereas in the baseline model, if you just see that $500 thing, you think, eesh, like, do I really need that? I don't have one now. It's not worth it. So that context and association of whether you have taken perceived ownership over it already in this model, and then you look at the small costs per month versus adding it on where you kind of just see the whole big thing. Uh, loss aversion is a real big player in that for sure. I think that that's another area affected by bundling too. Typically when companies are selling cars, they don't try to avoid the single little upgrade feature and sell packages or like the luxury package or the ultra luxury package. Because one thing that does is first of all, it makes life simpler for them. They don't have to build uh, 10,000 different versions of the same model, but also because it sort of disguises the value proposition of each item. If the leather seats would cost be a two thousand dollar option, somebody says, "Well, man, my leather couch only cost me one thousand uh, dollars. That doesn't seem like much of a deal for a few little leather surfaces on the front seats." Well, when it's all part of a bundle, it just seems like okay. I'm paying an extra few thousand dollars for this pile of luxury I'm getting here that has the heated seats and the leather and a few other fancy items to go. So. I think that was maybe research by Ariely or Lowenstein, I'm not sure, but it's um, selling any kind of complicated packages like that. I think there are so many nuances. And you mentioned a few others too, you know, like setting a high anchor price and, and so on. Oh, I was just going to say something that doesn't have to be a huge car or something along those lines that also kind of looks at this partitioning, pain of paying aspect we were just talking about is I have an example in the book of, I was needing to buy a razor holder, little thing for the shower, and it was $6.99, and the, which I was fine with, but it was $3.99 to ship it to me. And th I know this thing weighed less than an ounce, you know, you could ship it for 50 cents. And I agonized over this choice for like three weeks, which is ridiculous because I needed the thing, I actually knew the person that owned the company, but it was just, oh, I just don't feel good about it. And I was looking at things on Amazon. Maybe I should do it this way. If that extra decision by partitioning and separating out the fee from this process made it to where I wasn't really ready. It took a long time. And if it would have just been $9.99 or even $10.99 with free shipping, I would have bought it no problem and been very happy with the experience. But my overall feeling about the entire brand is now tainted by this one tiny aspect, this extra moment where it felt like they were really gouging me on shipping, which I know probably has nothing to do with them, 
but it just felt bad. And it, everything else became this big problem. I, at the beginning of the book, I use a quote from Peter Steidel that a brand is a memory. And it's that same, I can't unlive that moment. And it's impacted every decision I make with that particular company. And whenever I think about them now, because of just that one little moment that they potentially don't even realize is a problem. You know, in my friction book, Melina, I've got a little section that kind of provocatively titled delight is for dummies and talking about how there are certain things that delighting a customer doesn't do or isn't quite as powerful as doing some other things like making things incredibly easy. Uh, but it's really not always true. And it's meant to be a bit of a provocation there to get people to read what follows. And it's based on some research from Gartner about how an effortless experience is the thing that really creates loyalty. But I do think that delight is a really important factor. Talk a little bit about uh, delight and how it fits into your work and your book. Yeah. So I think in, in the space of surprise and delight, uh, and there's a chapter about it in the book where it's talking about how delight is needing to have a lack of expectation and delight really does drive loyalty, which is something that's very profitable and important for businesses and looking at ways, if you're trying to get away from this question of, you know, is it manipulation and whatnot? If you're looking at ways to be delighting your customers and have them have this really enjoyable, wonderful experience that they want to go positively tweet about, you need to be in a space of where you're providing things that are unexpected and in a positive way. And thankfully, because of some of the brain chemicals going on. There's a lot of dopamine that can be released when you have that anticipation of, am I going to win something versus having to give everybody whatever the delightful thing would be. And then you end up with an issue of expectation and it's not delightful anymore. So for businesses, it can actually be uh, cost effective to do a contest or something along those lines or just random giveaways for people that follow you on social media or, you know, whatever that is uh, to where you're able to be in this unexpected space and doing something that they enjoy and can be just excited about and get delighted if they win. Uh, you know, I give the example where Heinz ketchup did ads with Ed Sheeran and created Ed Chip which is seems super weird, except apparently Ed Sheeran really loves Heinz ketchup. He has a tattoo of the Heinz logo uh, because he just loves Heinz so much. And so for an anniversary special, they came out with these limited edition bottles where the tomato on the bottle looks like Ed. It's got little like leafy hair and glasses of Ed chip instead of ketchup. And they shared about it on social media and all these great followings and people excited and wanting to go get their limited edition bottles of Ed Chip, which is just ketchup. Uh, but it was a very delightful experience for him as well, which is important because he loves that brand so much. And then all of his followers know that he does and then they love it too. And it's just delightful and people share and feel like they want to be part of that conversation. I guess that's a true measure of brand loyalty if your customers have it tattooed on their right. body. And I can't think of too many brands that really incite that kind of loyalty. I mean, Harley Davidson may be right. sort of an overlap with tattoo users there too, uh, but um, also maybe Apple. I'm sure I've seen a few Apple tattoos out there, particularly before Apple became something that everybody had with the iPhone back when it was the Mac and kind of a counterculture thing almost. But yeah, that's... Definitely, if you can incite uh, that kind of customer feeling, you're you're going to be in business for quite a while. Yeah. And I think there's probably another kind of delight, too, that is maybe not necessarily a complete surprise, but I know I mean, a while back I had Jay Bear on the show and his co-author, Dan Lemon, and they talked about Doubletree Hotels where they give their customers a nice big cookie when they check in, or actually several cookies when they check in. And these are really good cookies. I mean, these are bakery quality cookies, uh, very fresh, very tasty. And the first time you show up at one of their hotels, you're definitely going to have that surprise delight factor. And uh, even after that, though, it's a self-reinforcing thing that you go back there. I'm sure there are customers who make that choice. If they're one of these typical sort of hotel meccas where there's six 
similar similarly priced hotels all within about a one block radius people will choose the double tree to get the cookies and probably the only risk factor there is the double tree is now locked into those if they ever stopped doing cookies <laughs> they would have a customer revolt yeah i actually uh talked about this a little bit and uh wrote a post somewhere i forget but that was talking at early pandemic days when everybody's sort of, you know, what do we do? And of course, hotels were suffering and how can you stay top of mind for people in this process? And so Doubletree gave away for the very first time ever their very secret chocolate chip cookie recipe so people could make it at home of saying, we know you're probably missing these business travelers or whatever. So you can have the joy of, you know, Doubletree while in the comfort of your home and we look forward to having you back with us when we can or you know however they message that and that was a delightful thing for people and as everybody was really baking a lot during pandemic and you get to try this great recipe that people love and it builds this additional association with the brand and you get some ikea effect in there all this goodness that can come from just giving that little piece you know reciprocity there's a lot of concepts happening in that space but it helps to reinforce their brand even when people couldn't stay with them i think that's a good example too molina that what seems like oh just a marketing gimmick oh hey let's give away our cookie recipe and maybe get a little bit of social media really has quite a bit of behavioral science baked i have to had to say <laughs> baked into that yeah. with all with all those different things that you mentioned, all those principles can be powerful alone, but this one really invoked multiple principles. So that's, uh, it's really a fantastic example. I'm curious whether you have a few quick pricing tips for our audience. I know that there are a lot of pricing topics in the book. What should somebody look at uh, for price? So would say that when it comes to pricing, Everything that happens before the price generally happens, mat uh, it more, matters more than the price itself. And I use this example, you know, funny enough that it's not about the cookie is how I've talked about it when I have episodes and things on this. Uh, but that's the, the scent of the cookies priming and drawing you in and making you uh, your subconscious brain ready to buy. You can use that loss aversion. The way you frame the message makes an impact. And so one of the biggest things where I see businesses go wrong when it comes to applying pricing is getting really uh, focused on the exact number of the price. And this really is an issue of bike shedding in where you think this is the most important thing. And until we figure out our exact price, we don't have to think about any of the, we can't even begin to think about these other things yet because this is the most important thing. If it's going to end in a, a five, a seven, a nine or a zero and what that perfect price is going to be. In reality, you know, research is pretty much, you know, if you're a gift or a luxury item, you end on the even number. If you are trying to be a, a discount or associated with something that's a deal, then you can end with something else. Uh, pick whatever you want. 975 doesn't really make that big of a difference. Move forward. <laughs> and then the strategy of, you know, what do you want people to do? What's the best product or service that you are trying to feature? How do you use that anchoring and relativity to showcase it as the best option for people? That thoughtfulness is all more important than that specific number. Melina, where can our listeners find you and your ideas online? Well, yeah, you can find me on all the socials as the Brainy Biz, B I Z, or just Melina Palmer on LinkedIn. You can also go to my website, which is thebrainybusiness.com, which has the Brainy Business podcast, links for my book, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You, uh, and all sorts of other great things. We have a community for everyone that's interested in behavioral economics to just get together and connect and chat and network just a free space called the Be Thoughtful Revolution that you can get to there as well. We will link to all of those places on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. And we will have audio and text versions of this conversation there as well. Melina, congratulations on the book. I was glad to be a tiny part of it and stay safe and good luck. Thanks so much, Roger.